I was really interested digging into your various interviews. And I think the thing that struck me the most is the breadth of topics that you speak about mm. in, in your interviews. And, and it's also the sort of really unique combination of, for me, it felt very unique to see you speaking about science in a very sort of like uh, traditional way, but then also spirituality as well and, and yeah. the weaving together of science and spirituality. And um, obviously at the heart of everything you talk about is this relationship between human health and sort of planetary health or yeah. environmental degradation. Uh, and that's really what I want to dig into in yeah. this interview today. Perfect. Um, but let's, why don't we like back up a little bit? Yeah, give me an overview of you, you and Earthrise yeah, here yeah. and all that. Well, when I start there, actually, that's probably a good a good place to start. You know, so my work over the last four or five years has been really focused on the climate crisis and, and communicating the climate crisis. Um, you know, I sort of first uh, had my wake up moment in 2015 on a trip to Greenland, to the Yakutsk mm, Glacier, wow. up into the Arctic and went very naive. You know, I'd heard about climate change like most people learn about it at school, but this trip was a real uh, wake up moment. We were literally transported to the front lines of climate change and it it sort of uh, brought it alive. You know, we, we heard it, we saw it, we felt it. And I, I decided to commit myself to trying to tell that story, but but not just the story of climate change and the environmental impacts that are happening around the world, but the, the human story. You know, how are people being affected by this issue? Because I, I felt at the time that that's often what's missing in the media. You know, mm -hmm. we hear, and I think it's changed a lot over the last few years, but back in 2015, climate change was just this sort of really overwhelming, intimidating topic that was confused by graphs and numbers, things happening in faraway places. And I think for that reason, it, it was hard to be, to feel moved by it. It just felt like something that was happening elsewhere, out of yeah. sight, out of mind. And of course, we now know that's, that's not the case at all. You know, many millions of people are already uh, living on the front lines of climate change. It's a life or death reality for, for many millions of people. And so over the last few years, I've really committed myself to telling that story, to telling the, the human impact of, of climate change. Um, but I sort of feel like over the last year, and it's why this interview actually feels particularly relevant to me, I sort of started to pull myself out of the kind of echo chamber of climate a little bit. I feel sometimes when I think about climate change, it's a little bit like watching a, a slow motion car crash mm -hmm. in a way. It's like this devastating unfolding thing, but you can't quite avert your eyes from it. And I feel I've really been fixated on that. And, and recently I've started to, to pull back and ask, well, what's led us to this place? What are the stories that have created this crisis? And realizing that the climate crisis is really just the symptom of a broken system, you know, of yeah. flawed stories and ideologies. And so what are those stories that we've been telling that, that have led us to this place? And digging into your work, you know, I saw a very similar theme there, which is that the current state of human health is the way it is because of these same set of, of flawed stories, of flawed ideologies. Yep. Uh, and human health is a, also a symptom of this broken system. And so I'm, I'm really interested starting to draw those links together to, to understand how they relate to one another. Um, but, but tell me about you. I'd love to know, you know, because I also listening to your interviews, I started to realize, to be really honest, how little I knew about the nuance of the medical industry and of human health. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll be honest, like some of your interviews just went straight over my head and it was like a yeah. real, wow, you know, I mean, I'm a human. I, I'm interested in my own health, yeah. but I have a limited knowledge of it. Uh, and so I'm interested in what, what led you on that journey? Like what made you first interested in, in human health and want to pursue that path? Yeah, originally I was heading down the path of engineering. I was very much a blue collar kid, grew up in you know, low housing in Boulder, Colorado and didn't have any grand exposure to academia or intellectual pursuits at all. I was really uh, enjoyed the outdoors, grew up scouting uh, throughout the Rocky Mountains and igloo camping and all kinds of wonderful stuff. And on the kind of occupation side, uh, by the time I was 14, I was uh, cleaning up construction sites that got me into carpentry and construction. And then uh, on my passion side at that time in my teens, I was in a classic car restoration and four wheel drive vehicle building and all this. And so I spent all my high school years and college years really in a garage or out on a construction site somewhere building something. And so I was decided I was going to go into engineering. It was the thought. And then, uh, in the classic way that only a 19 year old can do it. I had a, my first girlfriend and she broke my heart and I figured I got to have a whole year to process this heartbreak that I have, you know, I, and so that, that led to the idea of taking a year off from college and, uh, within minutes of making that decision, an aunt of mine called that had been living in the Philippines for 13 years and uh, invited me to work in a Pre, uh, pre and post natal care clinic with a group of international midwives. And so it sounded like a huge adventure. So 
I uh, needed to raise some money, so I worked in a tire shop for you know over time for about six months to raise to make enough money to get that trip to reality, and then went over to the Philippines and lived there for six months. And that experience, watching uh, those first few babies that I was able to be a part of their birth, was just so riveting in its miraculous nature. I had never, I think, I had never come face to face with miracles in such a palpable way, and. When I say miracles, there's, there's absolutely no neurologic process nor co- philosophical construct to justify what you're witnessing when you see a child born. It just defies all reality, and especially when that child looks at you and really looks into you. And that experience really shifted me big. And so came back from that experience, decided to go into medicine, wasn't a very good student, so I thought maybe nursing, and eventually kind of worked myself up to the possibility of applying to medical school. Got into medical school after uh, a couple of failed attempts <laughs> and got in, and in in my first few days of gross anatomy, dissecting a human body, it was when I found like my moment of <laughs> like the spark of my life. like. Yeah, suddenly I went from like struggling in school, impossible to memorize anything to understanding just about everything that was put in front of me. And so I kind of honored everything through all of medical school and everything else because in the construct of this this three-dimensional physical body that was given the opportunity to learn in such exquisite detail, you dissect a single human body for for over four months, you, you know every sinew, you know every muscle, you know every blood vessel, you know you know, the lymphatic system, like it's unbelievable the depth of which, you know, and suddenly I kind of found what I thought had been an engineering mind or, you know, kind of three dimensionality of the built world that I had applied it to. I suddenly realized that it it lent itself really well to understanding this three dimensionality of the human body and the systems that were within it. And so I found myself to be really uh, enjoy around systems thinking about the human body and that led me down a path towards internal medicine which is uh, I thought maybe you know surgery because I was good at working with my hands or whatever but I was so compelled by the systems of the body and the way in which they kind of coordinated the symphony of life and so that took me down into internal medicine which is kind of general adult care and then I specialized in endocrinology and metabolism which is the study of the hormone system and how it coordinates the body into its symphony And then subsequently, you know, I got into cancer research uh, through part of the endocrinology specialty, which is metabolism. And metabolism, in a word, is the description of how we liberate and utilize energy from the food that we consume. And interestingly, that's not a human story. It's a story of tiny little bacteria that live inside of our cells that we call mitochondria. And these little tiny bacteria are very specialized. It's actually two bacteria that have been absorbed one another. Uh, It's a little methane producing bacteria that got consumed by a larger bacterium called an, uh, an archaea, you know, about 3 billion years ago. And, and that process of, uh, you know, combining methane with a a respiratory surface of an archaea gave us the opportunity to move from fermentation as a method for producing energy on the planet to uh, a respiratory cycle. And respiratory energy is so explosive in its capacity to to liberate energy from the sunshine that's stored in food compared to fermentation that we were able to leap into multicellular function at that point. So multicellular life became possible when we had enough capacity for energetic release. And cancer ultimately is the opposite journey where you're losing energy, losing energy at the cellular level due to poisoning and death or dysfunction of the mitochondria. And without that energy, we develop cancer. And so the fact that we have a cancer epidemic today is ultimately symptomatic of the fact that we are turning the lights out at the cellular level on humanity. We are dimming our biology as a species and therefore we express cancer. And so I shifted at that point into nutrition and um, you know, focused on it. My, the chemotherapy I'd been developing was a vitamin A compound, which kind of was my introduction to the possibility that food could cure disease. And so that Hippocratic Oath, uh, you know, Hippocrates himself saying, you know, food is our medicine. Some couple thousand years ago in Chinese medicine saying it for 4,000 years, that kind of really came home at the cellular level for me in 2008, 9, 10. And in those years, I started to really pivot my, my belief about 
what we were seeing as a chronic disease epidemic, collapse of human fertility, all these things, and started to see that as an expression of environmental stress. And uh, nutrition became my passion, which led me into the food system to realize that the food system not only was the solution, it's currently our biggest you know, driver for the crisis of the planet. So nothing is more damaging the earth more rapidly and more you know, radically than our current modern food system and the way in which we've expressed it as a chemical industry. It's an amazing big picture of your, your journey. And it's, I always find it fascinating when you look back, you're able to draw those links, but I'm sure at the time, you know, you, you had no idea where you were going to go next. And it's only when you, you look back, you understand that thread that weaves it all together. Let's go back for a second to those early days in medical school. You mentioned you were dissecting human bodies. You know, for me, if someone who hasn't been to medical school, that idea in itself is just insane. I think as a normal person, we have a very like sanitized view of health and the human body. What, what was that experience like to you to, to dissect a human body over a period of time? I mean, in a word, you learn, I think, for the first time, reverence. Um, like I sat in churches growing up in a hippie church in Colorado and just you know, a lot of exposure to spirituality as a concept. But it moved from an abstract concept to an engaged experience through gross anatomy for me. Uh, the cathedral of this body is spectacular. It is dumbfounding that biology is able to create these bodies over and over again, right? You know, we've got 7.9 billion humans on the planet right now, and every one of them is laced together in nearly exactly the same way. And that is so dumbfounding just at the biologic level, let alone at the mathematical you know, level. Like the fact that you have 70 trillion human cells that know how to somehow form themselves, not just in their, you know, personal individual design, but then how they would then coordinate and cooperate across systems. How does the liver know what the hell to do with the, with the pancreas is telling it to you next door? How does the gallbladder know how to behave within the liver system? How does the brain know how to control the metabolism of the liver? How do the kidneys know how to cooperate to make neurotransmitters for the brain? How does the gut lining make 90% of the serotonin in the body? Like it's an insane system in its design in its intelligence in its inherent capacity for life and so that reverence started to come out of that sense of of the process of dissection uh ultimately you know as you start to look at the built world around us you realize we've just done a poor job of mimicking the nature within us you know uh, my father went to school at the National Cathedral in the United States and it's spectacular building. Like the it's, you know, among the most incredible construction pieces done in our country in the United States there. And it so I remember as a child walking through this place and imagining my my dad as a child going through this school within these these cathedral halls and everything else and Flying buttresses are the main mechanism by which we built these massive cathedrals before we had, you know, steel and a lot of the engineering, you know, underpinnings that we use today. And the flying buttress was an external structure that held the roof up on these things because the walls couldn't support the weight of the roof as it, you know, weighed down on the vertical walls. So the the flying buttresses came up and in a sweeping, almost wing-like fashion, suspended the ceilings of cathedrals all over the world. As you dissect a human body, you realize that we are a cathedral within ourselves and the, and the flying buttress system is our ribs that are extending from the foundation of our vertebrae. And so if you lay down on your back, your foundation of your cathedral is your spine and you have these flying buttresses in the ribs that are holding up the ceiling of your chest cavity that then makes space for your entire organ system and the like. And it all comes seemingly culminating into your neck, you know, so you've got this pelvic floor that looks like a radar dish that seems to receive, you know, a, a an information stream somewhere above us or within us or such that's projecting down into this radar dish of our pelvis and then projecting that straight up to the torso. And so we have this vibrational experience coming down through the pineal gland is thought to probably be the lens at which energetics express themselves in biology. And so you have an energetic focus that, you know, in spirituality, it's called a soul. 
in more, you know, you know, kind of scientific, you know, dead terminology. It's referred to as an electromagnetic field, but there's a large coherent electromagnetic field that then expresses itself in biology in the form of a human. That field has to have constant reinforcement. So the, there's a beam that has to be consistently expressed for you to stay alive so that each cell is knowing itself, expressing itself, coordinating itself. So the electromagnetic field of the human body coming down through the pineal gland, projecting down like a, a, a camera lens in a movie theater, shooting down in your pelvis and the pelvis reflects that back up and these flying buttresses of your ribs get tighter and tighter as they come up. And so you imagine this beam of light coming straight up through my body, narrowing and narrowing and narrowing, and then it comes up through my neck. And in gross anatomy, there's one bone that really caught my attention 30 years ago when I was first going through this experience, and it's called the hyoid bone. And it floats above your, your vocal cords and above your thyroid gland and your neck. And it, the reason it stuck in my mind so much was it was the very first thing that that academia admitted it had no idea what it did. And so I was so used to by a few months into medical school, everybody acted like they knew what the hell was going on. This is, is this blood vessel does this, this is this bone does this, connects to this. And then this this 80 year old uh, you know, guy who's a retired anatomist who was kind of always volunteering in our, our course, he was sitting at my elbow in the morning. I was dissecting the neck of my, the the woman that had donated her body to my my education, and I'm in the neck of this woman and and peel back some layers of the fascial plane, and suddenly there's this glistening bone that looks like the wishbone right out of a chicken or a turkey or whatnot, and this wishbone looking thing is is floating there, and like yeah. Bone is so amazing when you see it in a living system. You maybe have seen skeletons and things like this, the whitewashed bone, but living bone with is one of the most stunningly beautiful things you've ever seen. And even in the cadaver state where it's quote unquote dead, it's still surrounded by all of its connective tissue, the fascial plane and everything else. It, it's always pearlescent. Uh, bone, bone has a light source seemingly to it when it's living, living bone. And it just is beautiful to look at it and see it. And so it's got this pearlescent thing. So there's pearlescent, you know, kind of jewelry almost floating in the neck of this woman. And I was stunned by this hyoid bone and its delicacy. And uh, the anatomist leaned over and cleared a little bit of more you know, tissue from where my scalpel was, pulled it back, and I could see the whole hyoid bone suddenly. And he said this is the only structure in the body that we have no idea what it does. And that just amazed me to hear that. Like, here we are, you know, we can put people on the moon and we don't know what the hell this highway bone does. And it, yet it forms perfectly in every single human being. And it was in ceremony with an indigenous group about a year ago that I was given this, this visualization of what the highway bone does. And it was just so eloquent in it in the way in which this unfolded, but that beam of light coming up through the cathedral of my flying buttresses of my chest and all this. And I'm looking up through that basically in this meditation. I, it's like, I'm sitting down on the floor of my own pelvis, looking up towards my head and I'm watching that, that cone of light get narrower and narrow as it comes up into my neck. And then suddenly I could see the highway bone from below. And that beam of light of my expression of self was shooting right up through the neck. And the highway bone was tuning that, that energy field. And right behind the highway bone, when you look from the pelvis upwards, is the hard palate of the top of the mouth. And so the highway bone focusing my, my energetic light beam and then it, with its whatever tuning it's doing, then t is the last step before that beam hits my palate, which looks like a ski jump, basically, when you're looking from below. And it creates a, a horizontal effect on that vertical beam of me. And so my expression of self ultimately is tuned by my hyoid bone that sits in the middle of my neck. And then years later, I would find out that Chinese medicine and all, everything else have called this the fifth chakra or fifth energy center, which, which is our communication center. And so that this bone knows how to float in the center of your fifth chakra and be able to, it, it's the only bone that doesn't articulate in a joint. So it literally just floats in your neck. And so through the subtle movement of your vocal cords, through the subtle movement of your thyroid gland and its metabolism, you're tuning the expression of self and you're taking a vertical beam of energetics that would coordinate or 
make cohesive your expression of life within your biology suddenly goes horizontal at that moment and uh, becomes an expression to others. And so I think the in the end, that gross anatomy journey, sense of reverence for the cathedral that our body is, the miracle within it, but to find out in the end that it's there to create a horizontal projection of a vertical beam of light is a pretty fascinating statement of or distillation if you will of what a human body is there for so beautiful to listen to you talk about the human body the way you describe it as a cathedral a sort of ecosystem of parts that are working together in this like magical symphony almost and and when you say these things it makes so much sense to me but at the same time it feels strangely unfamiliar to hear a doctor speaking in this way you know it's usually a lot more scientific and numerical when you had your training at medical school, was this how you were taught to look at the human body? How are you? How, I think you know where I'm going with this question, but how are you prepared as a doctor to, to approach looking at a human body? Yeah, the, it's, um, I would say not, this doesn't, it is not limited to medicine. I would say education in its current format on the planet is designed for an extreme reductionist approach to understanding systems so that you can manipulate the system. And so business, law, medicine, engineering, you know, you pick your, pick your, your magic or whatever you're going to go into. You might be drawn to the engineering world for some reason or another, and then you get in and then it's ultimately this, this miracle of structure and the relationship of gravity and form and function and all this is reduced to girders 16 inches apart. And this is the building code and you're supposed to do this. And if you can build a house, you have to make things certain size and height and, and suddenly you've lost the whole magic of the built world it, as an expression of matter within the universe and our ability to play within that. And so that's essentially what medicine does is it takes a miraculous system of life and distills it down to this very reductionist list of, of concepts or constructs that are designed, the constructs are designed for us to intercede on. And so here's the concept of blood pressure. Here's, you know, 42 medicines that affect blood pressure. So use these medicines to lower blood pressure. There's cholesterol as a concept. Well, cholesterol seems to correlate with inflammation or, or vascular damage, so we should lower cholesterol. And so here's 12 drugs that lower cholesterol. So memorize those drugs and, and how to give those to patients and learn how to write a prescription to affect cholesterol. And so by the time you're four years into this process, you know, through medical school, you've so lost the miracle of life and you see yourself as a technician that's there to, to somehow manipulate or, you know, micromanage, if you can, the, the systems within the body, having forgotten that they are all elements of a life form that is exquisitely more complicated than you'll ever understand. And so, and this is maybe necessary, you know, to sit there as a doctor and make life and death decisions in an ICU uh, or what feels like life and death decisions. I don't know if any physician has ever actually changed the moment of death, but, uh, you know, we're given the impression that we have this great responsibility. And the, one of the responsibilities is to, to hold space for death, you know, and we may do that in the form of trying to resist death, but ultimately you're sitting there at the bedside with, with a family that's watching their loved one die and they're looking at you as if the responsible party in this situation. And so I think because of the gravity of that role of a physician or a nurse or practitioner of any sort in medicine, the reductionist approach allows us to be reassured that we know something. Mm-hmm. You know? And so I think medical education in general is a very robust attempt to give us the, some sort of secure of, you know, peace that, oh yeah, we've got it all figured out. We know how to deal with this and we know what death looks like. We know what disease looks like. We know what drugs treat diseases. It's all good. You, you got this, you can do this because it would be really uncomfortable perhaps if you started your first day of medical school and, and they said, you're not, you're going to understand absolutely nothing about life at the end of this four years because all we really know is a few elements of biology we don't at all understand quantum physics and how it relates to biology so we're going to just leave quantum physics out completely even though the cell is not really made of cells it's made of atoms which make molecules 
we're too awkward in our understanding of how atoms work and how they would relate to biology. So we're going to leave all of that out. So you're not going to know, you're not going to understand the actual fabric of, of a body. We're going to pretend biology is the fabric of bio, biology. And then when, because that's super complicated, we actually don't know how a single cell stays alive, let alone communicates to other cells around it to coordinate life. We're going to just boil this down to like a few organ systems that you can memorize. And then you can see the body as a construct of these eight organ systems that we like to talk about cardiovascular, neurologic, pulmonary system, the renal system. And so we, in this reductionist approach, kind of try to reassure ourselves that, that we have the capacity to be doctors or whatever it is. And so in that gravitas of being at this this intersection of human life and, and the frailty of our, our health or vitality or, or life as we see it in relationship to death, we we have to to create these systems of belief so that we feel safe, you know. And uh, ultimately, I felt less and less safe over time. And I think that's true for everybody. Like the longer you're an engineer, the longer you're an architect, the longer you're a doctor, the longer you're a lawyer, you start to realize the constructs you were given to try to give you a sense of professionality or expertise far missed the reality of the the system that you're studying or becoming expert in. And I think every elder you've ever met that's been in an industry for 40, 50, 70 years tells you, we don't know what the hell we're doing. We, it, we need to let go of all the constructs and we need to be present and need to become creative in our work. And so you see architects suddenly do a, a design that's never been seen before. You see the, a physician give up the medication list and start to really connect to their patients at the spiritual, emotional level to be witness to their journey rather than try to manipulate their journey as a, as somebody who's moving towards death. And that, that really got to be witnessed in my career because uh, after I left academia, I, I went and got a third subspecialty in palliative care, hospice care, end of life management. And you know, my little service that I had was admitting 80 patients a week. Average lifespan was three weeks from, from admission. So we were seeing enormous amount of death every week. And in that journey, I got to see and I see some of the most beautiful human moments I will ever see. And I got to express some of the most beautiful aspects of my humanity in sitting at bedsides and simply listening to human stories, listening to loved ones talk about their loved one who's dying, listen to the one who's dying, come back and forth across the veil of what we call reality with information from the other side, speaking to ancestors, speaking to other entities, speaking to trees, you know, and coming back and forth across that veil. And you start to see hundreds and then thousands of patients in that ethereal space of this rebirth of, of energetics that we call death, you realize, wow, we have so screwed up our concept of life because we feared death to begin with. And we thought it was something to resist rather than something to, to revere. We see it as an end point instead of the beginning of, of the next thing. And so in that kind of reversion, it got me back to my first days in the Philippines birthing babies, you know, and imagining what it's like to enter this world in a, as a physical being. You know, you've got an energy field that was coherent before you were conceived, it seems, because the moment you were conceived, that egg started dividing and that egg and sperm as it started to divide knew exactly what it was forming instantly. There was no waiting for the template to occur. And so there's an energy field within the womb of a mother that's already present to express this biology that will unfold uh, after this, this moment of conception. And so that energy field, certainly not connected to a body beforehand, must know something about its existence within a cosmos that's not limited by a physical body. And then imagining that thing lacing itself together within a physical body, and then a, a kind of nascent human consciousness experiencing the womb. What a beautiful thing that must be what a beautiful experience it must be to hear your mother's heartbeat day in day out booming away in the cathedral and you're literally in the, the womb down at the center point of the pelvis so that whole beam of light we discussed is is shining down you know through this space and so you can imagine standing in the cathedral sun coming through the the stained glass windows i think it's why we're drawn to these spiritual places that we build and stained glass has this way of turning light into these 
you know, auras of blues and purples and oranges and yellows and all of this. And that's what it looked like in the womb. So I think that walking through the National Cathedral is our best effort at recreating what it feels like to be in the womb of your mother. Uh, the light filtering through the stained glass, just like the light filtering through the belly of your mother as she lays out in the sun uh, with you in the womb. And it's a stained glass experience of life. You can't distinctly see shapes or forms, but you get shadows and you get changes of color and tone throughout the day and changes of the light spectrum coming in. And so the cathedral of the human body is a place that holds a, a sacred space for a new soul to express itself within the womb of a mother. And that whole journey, then imagining that child in the, in this beautiful cathedral suddenly being pressed through the birth canal. So much pressure, your head collapsing, you know, water breaking. And so now it's no longer protected and floating in this water balloon kind of space. It's now got physical force all around and it's being crushed. And that, that being must know this is the end of everything. Like, you know, the light is gone. The reverberation of my mother's heartbeat is gone. I'm being pressed through some tunnel and I'm being crushed. I'm dying. I'm, I'm, there's nothing left. And then suddenly it comes out of the birth canal and sees this reality that we live in here in which the five senses must just you know completely overwhelm an unwired brain. A brain that's never seen or heard what's about to see or hear has no reference point. So it's a cacophony of neurologic input in those first few days, weeks, months of a child's life. And that's why they can't speak yet. They can't take it in there. They, they can't focus on your face because they've never seen a face. They don't know that versus the light refraction in the window. They're both, you know, just expressing different forms of beauty. And so they can't focus for a while. And then when they do start to focus on your face, it's never your eyes that they look at. They're looking up at your forehead or up above your head because they're seeing light refraction. And so this light that's beaming down through your body, they're seeing some of that junction point, the pineal gland right here behind the third eye as, as, as it's referred to in Chinese medicine and others. That forehead must look really brilliant to a child who's just emerged in this reality and hasn't tuned or reduced their reality to the five senses yet. And I think that's basically what the five senses do over time. It neurologically pairs down your sense of the, re of the world around you. I think at birth, these babies are seeing things we can't see with the, the five senses. They're experiencing you know, vibration beyond the visible spectrum of light, for example, and they're experiencing the infrared, the ultraviolet. Um, it's just an extraordinary thing to see a child come out in this state of complete connect understanding and seeing the complete connectivity of everything. Their brain has billions of more connections at that moment than it does just six months in. And so the process of learning is actually cutting dendritic connections. So there's less, less pathways for the information to flow. And so for the child to learn to see, hear, taste the world, every kid sticking everything in their mouth, trying to taste it, trying to figure it out, what's happening is they're reducing their sense of reality for, for a couple of years to the point where they can, from a frail little gray matter brain, start to make pattern recognition, start to hear sound and recognize it as voice and then recognize words and then understand connection of meaning to those words. And that process is so ridiculously fast. Like a brain figures that out in nine months, 12 months before they start to say their first word. Like it's, it's unbelievable. And so this child starts to understand things by being reductionist, by taking all of the, the understanding of all connecting of everything else with their neurologic system, paring it down, paring it down, paring it down. And so medical school, as I described it, is simply uh, the most intense learning experience you'll ever mean you go through, which means it's the most reductionist thing that'll ever happen to your brain. And so you will end that specialization of law or medicine or engineering or whatever it is. You will be your most reduced belief about the reality you live in and you will know less about life than you ever did when you were born for all of the learning that you did. And so that's a bit of a dismal look at our education system, I think. But it, it explains why we express the society that we live in.
It's disconnected from its reality. It's it's not seeing the forest for the trees. We engineer things that are so have such detrimental things to the planet, even though we think they're good. We got this whole industry called green energy or whatnot. You know, windmill. Wind seems infinite. Wind's a renewable energy. It must be right. It's always blowing. It's free. No cost to grabbing that. So let's just engineer a windmill that can do that. And so we build these giant windmills and. I go to the Amazon rainforest last year and flying over in these little bush planes, uh, tree canopy larger than the entire you know country of the United States. It's it's so massive when you start to take it in, you just can't. Your your neurologic system is overwhelmed by the scale. The Amazon jungles flying and flying, and then suddenly see these huge highways ripping into the heart of the Amazon. And I'm, what the heck are these roads? This must be oil and gas. I've heard about oil and gas destruction of. And so I was like, is that the oil and gas companies moving in? Oh, no, no, that's the wind wind farm projects. It's like, well, there's no windmills here. What are you talking about windmill projects? Oh, no, the Chinese bought up all of the balsa wood trees of the entire Amazon and are building highways in to remove all the balsa wood trees from there so that they can ship them back to China and they're building the, the windmill veins out of that balsa wood. And so this this is the reductionist you know, the result of reductionist minds saying, let's create green energy out of wind. Let's go cut down all of our forests and our most precious commodities in the form of trees so that we can capture more energy so that we can turn on more TVs so that we can you know, be more distracted from the reality we live in. So that's, why do we do that? Why, why is that happening? It's ultimately, interestingly, the phenomenon of the belief that we need to learn something instead of simply know everything. I believe a child coming into the world knows everything in the sense that it's neurologically, energetically connected to source in a way that we immediately start to deprogram and, and take it away from source. And so we see a movement happening now. We see change happening, and I'm grateful for that. We see a whole movement of homeschooling and, and now this whole movement of unschooling. And realizing that children are far more intelligent by the time they hit high school if they're not told that we know anything. And just to let them have an experiential journey into this world instead of you know, take them through a reductionist you know, approach that they understand the whole concept of a multiple choice test. Yeah. Here's five, five answers. Four of them are wrong. Pick the right one. What the, what the hell kind of system of learning is that? Present the brain with five wrong things. And so you're... And so my brain was always overwhelmed by multi, multiple choice tests. I, I was notoriously a bad test taker. I could, I could express so much better if I was allowed to speak about what I knew rather than try to answer somebody else's version of, of that take through a multiple choice test. But it's something that we're learning now as an education system is that we needed to stop reducing the world to a multiple choice and start allowing life to be as miraculous and ever changing as it is. Mm. Uh, life is, is one thing is a, a, a dynamic system that is always reaching for more diversity, more biodiversity equals more adaptation. The faster you get adaptation, the more biodiversity you get, more biodiversity you get, the faster adaptation. So there's a feedback loop happening in the expression of life on the planet that's allowed for life to emerge here. And that iterative process of biodiversification and adaptation is, is done through some beautiful mechanisms that are built into the fabric of the universe here. And one of them is viruses. And so... Uh, what we find in the end today is as we reach kind of the end point of our reductionist approach of understanding life, if you will, in that reductionist approach, the only end point is fear. And so we, through our reductionist rabbit hole of life, reach this point where we fear everything. We fear the nature that we are within. We fear scarcity within that nature because we're disconnected from it. We don't know abundance. Uh, we fear ourselves as a species, you know, we, climate change and all the destruction we're metting out through all these systems. So we come to fear ourselves. Uh, in that fear, we destroy each other. Uh, war continues to tear us apart and we're horrific to each other in the home as much as we are on the on the national level of these these you know chest pounding wars that we do and so we are horrific to ourselves as a species because we f have a deep seated fear that has resulted from our sense of disconnect from the miracle of life 
there's so much in what you've just said there, Zach. <laughs> I thought I could sort of sit here listening to you speak forever. You've put me out of a job. I can just <laughs> listen to you talk and link all these things together. But I want to I wanna go back for a, a, a quick second because there was one thing you said actually a little bit earlier that's really stayed with me, which was this comparison between the, the stained glass in the church and our experience in the in the womb and that image really... Uh, is sitting with me and I'm almost thinking about the sounds as well in a church, the sort of echo in the muffled sounds, a bit like being inside a, a womb. And you really kind of um, beautifully have explained the reductionist uh, point of view of, of the medical industry on the whole of the healthcare industry. Uh, and you talked a little bit about your uh, departure from that as well, working in palliative care, your sort of wake up moment. Um, I wonder if you could paint me a picture of the healthcare system today or sort of, of human health today because I think I sort of grew up thinking you know people are living longer than ever before we've eradicated all sorts of diseases um, we have amazing medicines and technologies that can solve all sorts of ailments people people are healthier than ever before right I think I had this quite naive perspective and I wonder if you could help me un understand where this this perspective this reduction reductionist perspective has led us in terms of human health today yeah. Um, so the lifespan did improve really greatly over the 20th century. It was pretty impressive. You know, end of the 20th century average lifespan in the Western world was 50 years or so. It was pretty short. Um, but it turned out that that average was largely because of mortality in the first you know, one or two decades of life. And most of that was traumatic death and some of it was infectious disease. And the infectious disease that was shortening that lifespan was uh, primarily the result of you know, uh, human development that was pretty toxic, you know, and so we had, uh, we were cooking and heating with kerosene and coal uh, and, and all of the homes of London, for example, you know, in the turn of the 20th century. And it turns out that leads to an enormous amount of carbon particulate in the air and ultimately in our lungs. And so that shifts our relationship to viruses, bacteria, and all kinds of things by having that that heavy carbon particulate air pollution in our space and ultimately the kerosene and, and coal in the home is poisoning our our body's immune systems and so we developed tuberculosis and we developed you know all kinds of different you know dysenteries of the gut and cholera and things like this um, as a result of you know primitive plumbing and exposure to to stool and all this in our water systems and so it was our first attempts at civilization as a quote-unquote modern society where we really screwed up human health for that we blamed tuberculosis cholera as these germs that were coming in to attack us and so we saw ourselves then in opposition to nature at the at the cellular level and so we developed this whole concept that germs are trying to attack us. The human immune system is trying to sterilize us and keep us safe. If we stop sterilizing the blood, then we get disease, we get sepsis, we get cellulitis of the skin, we get you know, all these things. So we had this us and them belief um, by the end of the 20th century, which wasn't actually the dominant form you know, previous to this. And even in the, in the 1800s, there was an incredible debate going on between Louis Pasteur and one of his colleagues, Bechamp. And so these two French, you know, intellects were were dueling it out for about twenty years in the late eighteen hundreds, and they, you know, Pasteur was convinced that germs were attacking healthy human beings to hurt them. So watch out for the tuberculosis, watch out for cholera, it might kill you. But not only Bachamp, but then there were some others that were really, you know, promulgating the understanding that no, that's not how it seems to be working because we can see twins with the same immune system, same genetics and all that expressing completely different forms of disease based on the environment we put them in. And so maybe it's got something to do with the health of the organism rather than these externalizations of, of germs or whatnot that was expressing disease. N nature versus nurture, right? I'm that's an right. identical twin, so I'm always interested in those studies. It's fascinating, yeah. And so that, what is the influence of our biology or how is our biology an expression of the environment in which we live? And so Bichamp really believed that it was an environmental stimulus that would cause any disease, whether it be cancer or tuberculosis. And so he was arguing that, toughed out for 20 years, and then it really shifted at the beginning of the 20th century when the Rockefellers and some of the other big oil magnate families uh, started to align with this new possibility of, of using oil as a backbone to a chemical industry that would create pharmacy. 
Um, up until this moment, pharmacy was apothecaries that used herbals and plant compounds and all this. At the turn of the 20th century, a gallon of, of oil produced a fair amount of wealth, but they realized a single drop of oil could create all kinds of new chemicals that could be used to change biology and all of this. And so we started to really develop the chemical industry aggressively in the beginning of the 20th century. And in creating these new molecules that had never been in nature before, we started to be able to manipulate nature very quickly. We could kill things that had never been killed before. So uh, we were using mercury and silver and all kinds of heavy metals to treat bacterial infections and all this because you kill organisms by touching them with with these toxic heavy metals. And then we started creating you know compounds out of nature, salicylic acid, which is aspirin patented by Bayer in like 1904 or something like this. And, and so they, that beginning of the 20th century was this real big shift away from natural remedies, natural inputs to the human body for health, to this understanding that we could create an enormous amount of wealth and a sense of power over biology by creating new chemicals. And so that really steamrolled by you know the advent of war. So World War One, World War Two, um, was the advent of chemical warfare, and we started to use very high concentrations and extreme volumes of chemicals in warfare. There had actually been a treatise in 1898 that included you know uh, some 40 countries or something has signed a treatise of peace that chemical weapons would not be used uh, because uh, we were starting to realize how toxic these things could be mustard gas being one of the most potent ones so that's 1898 everybody agrees that would be horrible for planet and people if we allowed this stuff to get out as a warfare weapon because it can't be contained it's not like a bomb that goes off and kills 10 warriors this stuff stays in nature it destroys nature it destroys civilization so we had that understanding 1898 and then just less than 20 years later world war one breaks out and we have a massive distribution of mustard gas across the world and we start poisoning one another on battlefields all over europe and and the western world with mustard gas and then you know this war spread into russia and everything else and so we poisoned the planet like never before in 1916 with mustard gas and then if you look in textbooks the worst flu season ever was 1917 and killed you know 20 million people conservatively could have been twice that and so way more than that were killed in the war died from flu that year flu's never been that toxic again was never that toxic before the fact that our textbooks continue to teach us that flu killed 40 million people that year is ludicrous because what happened is we poisoned the world with mustard gas which destroys the lung lining denuding it of its normal healthy immune system and we died of mustard gas poisoning globally and we blamed the freaking virus for that and so we have been notoriously excusing the damage of our chemical industry over and over again by blaming viruses up until now uh, the the huge fires that burned in 2019 set the world up for a global pandemic of, of lung injury and we blamed coronavirus for it but in fact we've so poisoned the earth not just the fires in 2019 in australia which were the biggest in history biggest fires in central africa and in south america burning through all the way through the end of 2020 and then right at the beginning of 2021, we lit fires up and down the whole western coast of the United States that you know burned and, you know again this huge atmospheric distribution of carbon into the atmosphere to keep this respiratory injury going. So for three years we had the worst fire systems in ever seen in modern history, and we called it coronavirus situation. You know, so we've done it over and over again. Zika virus, huge chemical spills, and is causing you know. Uh, malformation of of infants down in in the, the kind of tropics in the south of the united states uh, from this big chemical injury to the planet and so we came up with a, a argument that maybe zika virus was causing the, this anencephaly or malformation of the brain head in in utero and so over and over again we've bizarrely over the last hundred years looked again and again to blame viruses when in fact we've in our chemical industry poisoned the planet over and over again at higher and higher scales uh, throughout history. So, so we've had this interesting shift in human history based on our relationship to chemical inputs. And after World War II, 
there was a sudden loss of industry for chemical warfare. There was also a sudden overload of, of once again, fuel. We had ramped up the biggest mechanical war machine ever seen in history, tanks, planes all over the world. And this oil and gas industry had revved up to meet that demand and suddenly the war is over. So what are we going to do with all this oil and gas? And similar to the Rockefellers in the early 20th century, uh, kind of with the birth of the pharmaceutical industry and damming the the whole herbalism market and things that we'd done for thousands of years was now you know put out there as witchcraft and all this stuff with the Flexner report that happened in 1910, and so we damned traditional medicine and rolled in chemical pharmaceuticals at the begin beginning of the century and then in 1940s and 50s coming out of World War II we repurposed chemical warfare for food agriculture and we called it the Green Revolution so and maybe truth in advertising, we use the word revolution. And so we used, started a war on the soil and we started a whole new you know, milieu of chemicals that we would apply to uh, as quote unquote fertilizers and then ultimately as herbicides and pesticides to kill green things that we call weeds and to kill any insects in the fields. And you can imagine what happens to nature when you remove green stuff on the ground and all the insects that would pollinate and everything else is you you lose life and you lose vitality. And so our chemical industry towards pharmacy at the beginning and then towards chemical agriculture in the mid, mid-century set us up for the colossal collapse of biology on the planet that's now unfolded over the last 50 years. We've seen you know 50% of life on Earth disappear. We've depleted or severely depleted 97% of arable soils on the earth. We've killed 97% of indigenous peoples. Like it has been one of the most horrific centuries ever, you know, to be recorded. And it was this shift from natural systems into disruptive chemicals that really led the charge in these different you know, parts of our history. The way you, that I'm hearing you talk about health is, is what I think would be described as holistic. It's certainly unconventional. Um, and in some ways, I suppose, in that regard, it's a threat to the sort of traditional medical industry, which is a huge industry globally, but I know particularly in the United States. Do you feel, do you ever get pushback from the things that you say? Like, how do people receive the ideas that you're sharing? I suppose I would get pushback if I was trying to make money or something like that. But I, I'm out, you know, educating and, and I'm always, I always welcome different viewpoints and I'm always excited. I, the thing I enjoy more than anything else is, is the curiosity of learning and the curiosity of this, you know, kind of expression of perspectives. And so I'm always eager to hear other people's perspective. And I've been in debate with, you know, thousands of people over the last couple of years about the pandemic and all that. And, so far, I haven't seen somebody else explain how people were showing up hypoxic without respiratory failure from a coronavirus. Like, how is that even possible? What is it in a virus that you think could present as a non-infectious disease? Like, how is that possible? And so when you present what we were literally seeing in the ICU with our current understandings, you start to realize that not just medicine, but society is not running itself on an understanding of science, but on a, on a series of narratives. And this is not new. Uh, there's a great quote that says, humans aren't made of molecules, they're made of stories. And I believe I've seen a lot of evidence of that in these last couple of years that it takes a, just a very consistent, not necessarily coherent, but very consistent message to change the behavior of humanity. So Zach, we've talked a little bit about storytelling and narrative and this is something I'm personally really interested in. You know, Earthrise was set up with the aim of telling stories around the climate crisis, making it more understandable and accessible, but also using the power of storytelling to try and create change. And I'm interested in the stories that we've told that have led us to this point. And I've heard you talk about the sense of separateness, of isolationism. Uh, and I wonder if you can draw some links there. How has that sort of anthropocentric way of thinking, this idea that we are masters of and separate to nature. How has that informed the current modern day healthcare system? Yeah, I mean, even broader than healthcare technology. So why did we create technology of healthcare? Why did we create technology for the built world, or et cetera? Um, a deep wound within us is an abandonment disorder. You know, we, we have an abandonment disorder that began at the belief that, that nature wasn't taking care of us, that we would have to, you know, met out life against nature. And this schism, you know, I think took stepwise things. You could see different civilizations dropping into this pattern over the last 10,000 years or so. Uh, previous to 10,000 years ago, it's possible that things, you know, were, were 
in a sense of connectedness. And as soon as you believe yourself to be connected to nature, which is to say the fabric of reality throughout the entire universe, you realize that energy is infinite. You realize that everything is infinite. There's, there's no shortage. Of, it's impossible that nature would become short of things four billion years into its emergence on this planet. And so um, that sense of scarcity that comes from the sense of abandonment from our own nature i.e. our own God. And so religion kind of played a bit of a role here where religion started cropping up saying, well, God is outside of yourself. You know, you have to, you're, you are inherently flawed. You have to get yourself back to God by doing the following things, knowing the following things, saying the following things, singing the following things. And so by this kind of separationism of na natural world and divine world, we became very fearful. And so even in, in our primitive, you know, culture state, you know, before even the expression of language, I think there was fear was visible in the, in the human. And so somewhere deep in there is this abandonment wound uh, from our divine state and from our nature. And for that, we develop that sense of scarcity. And for the sense of scarcity, we become extractive because if, if there's a risk of scarcity, then you need to get to store up a bunch of stuff and you need to get more stuff for yourself. And my goodness, if you have enough stuff, your kids might not have enough stuff. So you should get some more stuff. So we make sure you can pass stuff to your kids. But goodness, like what if things get really bad and the whole community is starting to fail? We should get more stuff. And so that birthed colonialism as a concept and, and the colonial mind is ultimately just the expression of fear of scarcity. And so we can, you know, I don't think anybody sets out to be like, I want to destroy all peoples in North America. So I'm going to get on a ship from Europe and I'm going to go over, destroy 600 nations and pillage and rape all of their, their systems until we've taken everything. I don't think that was the sentiment in any of the, the the poor people that were jumping onto ships to try to find some new future. As they, they were barely making it, they weren't conquestors out to kill things. There's an argument maybe the Spanish initially were, but certainly this wave that came from Europe that was mostly the most desperate and disparate you know groups of people that were jumping ship from Europe to try to go find something in what was a, an incredibly challenging journey. You know, it was like life-threatening the mortality of people landing in the new world was extreme so people were basically taking ships to their the high likelihood of their own death because they were so desperate here that's because the scarcity mentality on this little continent had become so entrenched for so many thousands of years that it sucked the resources that we had deforested all of europe we had destroyed all natural habitats we had hunted everything into extinction that was bigger than us and bigger than a house cat like we had we had destroyed the whole ecosystem and so we were starving we were seeing collapse of infrastructure we we're seeing you know massive you know poverty and all this stuff so we escaped that and started to extract from a new continent but there were 600 nations with 100 million people already there that weren't extractive, weren't destructive, at the, certainly not at the same scale of just a few hundred years of, of kind of this colonialism that, that set in there. So for tens of thousands of years, those 600 nations had been in a you know abundant state of agriculture that was more advanced than what we had at Europe in the time that we landed there. They understood permaculture, you know, techniques that we would call today were age old practices there. Uh, we understood, they understood the importance of biodiversity. Every f square meter of the, the ground was understood to need biodiversity in it. And so they always planted biodiversity for every square meter. Europeans had said, well, we'll put in rows and rows of potatoes here and then we'll put the squash way over there. And we forgot about biodiversity as, as a cooperative model for how life occurred. And we created monotony, reductionist approach to food production. And so we were suffering at the, at the health level in Europe because we didn't have nutrient diversity. We didn't have the underpinnings of biodiversity in our food system, i.e. soil systems anymore. So we go over and see 100 million people thriving and say, well, there's plenty for everybody. And they don't have a sense of ownership, which means they must be really primitive. We know how to own things. We know how to build things. We know how to make fences. So we went over and we built a bunch of forts with high walls and all this and started to cut down forests and put up fences and say, this is my farm, this is your farm, and drive out the peoples that had been sharing that space for, for millennia. And so that is the result of the scarcity versus abundance mentality and scarcity built on fear is a very potent weapon and it drives people to do things that they never intended to do. They'll, they'll go kill other living beings 
out of fear that they're under attack or separate from those living beings, whether they be animals or hu- other humans. And so this is, this is what we've done with the colonial mind is we have maximized the technological capacity for the expression of extraction at the cost of the planet, at the cost of our humanity, uh, because we are so afraid that we are alone and we have scarcity for it. Some really, really powerful links there between colonialism and, and indigenous wisdom. And I feel like we are living through a time where indigenous wisdom and thought is having a sort of resurgence in the public consciousness. I mean, it's always been there. It's been there long before we've been there, but people are starting to wake up to the significance of this thought, given the troubled times that we live in. Um, how can we as two white Westerners from wealthy countries that have a long history of colonization honor those wisdom keepers, lift up those voices in a way that is sort of true, honorable and respectable as we go forward. And shut up. We can shut up for a little bit and we can sit down and break bread. We can, we can have a meal together. That's where it's all going to begin. We need to start to fellowship as humanity again. We need to sit down our social medias. We need to set, set down the distractions of a productivity driven culture uh, of wealth. And we need to start to, to see the natural systems as the only measure of wealth worth living for. And uh, we also really need to quickly lose our definition or usage of the term indigenous. Probably. I think that, you know, that's the one word you never hear when you're with an original people's they never say we're indigenous. <laughs> it's obvious they're from there. But the news is, is that the two of us sitting here, white, wealthy, are indigenous to earth. We're all from this place. This is our roots. This is where we have developed for tens of thousands of years. Uh, this is our home. And this othering of indigenous versus you know, modern or whatever word you're using in your head, you know, as a Westerner is a real crisis because it's again, putting this belief of scarcity back in the mix of our, our social reality or our human humanitarian reality. We are all indigenous. We are all of this earth. We all come from the same tribe called human, you know, it's, and so we have, we need to stop othering the concept of indigenous and realize that there is wisdom on the planet. I just spent some days with John Butler, who is an extraordinary you know, thinker, meditator. I've uh, been meditating in this little chapel in Northern England for 60 years, four hours a day. You know, he's, he's a white Northern European guy with a big white beard, looks a bit like Santa Claus and looks like your favorite grandfather that you've ever met. And you know, to the Western eye, nobody would call him indigenous. But in fact, he's just as original peopled as anybody in South America or Africa will be because his peoples have been here for tens of thousands of years. Therefore, they are white skinned because they've been living in northern climates for tens of thousands of years. And therefore, he appears how he is. He is an expression of the environment, the sun exposure, the soil systems, the nutrients here. He is tens of thousands of years into his expression as human. And so the color of our skin is simply an expression of our locality to this mother of nature. And so here's John Butler spilling wisdom out of the space between his words in such a way that you you might as well be in front of a Mayan elder or whatever, whatever other original peoples you want to pick. But we need to quickly lose the idea of indigenous and realize we are all part of one human race. And we need to understand that that human race is an expression of complex biology within us that is hardly human. And we were wrong about the sterilization of the human body for human health. We now understand that the body is teeming with life. Uh, my brain has thousands of species of microbes expressing it, themselves in my brain right now. There's, it's not an infection. It's not, you know, meningitis or encephalitis. They are thriving within organic soil within my brain, within my kidneys, within my liver, within the breast of a woman. Every organ is thriving with bacteria and fungi, yeast, etc. And for that thriving of biodiversity, it expresses health. The more we sterilize the human body with antibiotics through herbicides and pesticides in our food, and the, the herbicides have now, as water-soluble molecules, ended up in the air we breathe and the rain that comes down. So we are now saturated with antibiotics and it's killing the life within us. 
certainly the bacteria within our gut, but also the mitochondria inside our cells, which are small bacteria that live inside our cells. So we're destroying life within the gut and life within the human cell. And for that, the lights are going out on humanity. And so we express chronic disease epidemics. We express infertility at levels that never imagined before. And in this short little decade in, in the past, you know, a year, few years, where we've reached one in three males with infertility due to sperm count, one in three women infertile due to failure of the ovarian cycle. And so we are maybe have you know, 60, 80 years left of human fertility, which is an interesting number because if you go talk to PhDs in soil science, they say we've got 60 harvests left on earth at the current rate of loss of topsoils. And so it's not surprising that the fertility of the soil and the fertility of the human that would be the result of this biology of earth and food systems would have to have their demise at the same moment. But we live in a time and a, a scientific realization where we can see that endpoint, which gives us the opportunity to change our behavior, which gives ourselves the opportunity to tell a new story, a new narrative for humanity and write ourselves back in nature. That's all it's gonna take is a new story. And so what you're doing at Earthrise with the power of narrative is let's start telling the story in which humans align themselves with the nature that they understand is not only allowing them to be here, it's inherently expressing itself in us to be who we are. And so we are the expression of nature. She is not against us. We cannot be against it. We are the expression of nature. We're the highest intelligence that that nature has expressed on this planet so far, perhaps. And so we are in a relationship with beauty. We are emerging as a beautiful species in these last couple hundred thousand years. And if we will rewrite ourselves into our nature, into our divine state, instead of seeing ourselves separate from the divine, separate from the nature, we will start to express a state of abundance that has maybe never been seen in human history before. And in that, we may finally discover our own humanity, which is that we love because we can see beauty. And the wonderful thing about the experience of beauty is that you never have to teach anybody that. There is no school that teaches a child to appreciate a sunrise or a sunset. And yet as we age over the decades, we come to hold that sunrise and sunset as more and more pivotal to our quality of life. And we sit there in the silence in the morning and watch that sunrise. I, I was at, over at a park in downtown London this morning and it was so stunning to see the mist coming off the water in this tributary of the Thames and uh, the geese out there swimming and the swans and the mist rising, this dense dew on the grass, the sunbeams shooting through these trees down into to, bedazzle that dew sitting on the grass like it was so magical and i'm sitting in here in the middle of a massive city that believes in extraction from the world and is you know the center point of a, a colonial empire that still is clinging on to something of its previous glory and yet nature is sitting there bejeweled in the midst of it showing us what's actually valuable showing us what actually it feels like to be alive and breathe the humidity of air that's just been expired by earth with her breath out in the morning that beauty of that park is sitting there right there for everybody in london to ground back into and be like oh my gosh I, I thought that the stock market was important oh my gosh i thought that the bottom line for my company was the driving force of my purpose the driving force of your life if you showed up on earth right now is to witness beauty again at such a deep level that you realize you're a part of it and ultimately we need to look into each other's eyes and realize the beauty in one another and for that maybe fall in love with our humanity for the first time